Thank you. So my first question would be to the youngest member of the panel. So you started the startup around a year back, and you have got total work experience of just a year, year and a half. And how did you even think about going ahead and going ahead with the startup as a venture? What kind of, what did your parents say? What did your friends say? Do you think they were nuts, or you got uh, sufficient support from all of them? Uh, so uh, it was a mixed bag of reactions that we kind of got when uh, we were starting up. Uh, one, one and a half years into the startup, I'm still convincing my mom that I've started up, and yeah. I still want to be doing this. And, uh, but apart from that, uh, they've been supportive. Uh, to a lot of friends, it seemed cool, although it's not. Uh, but uh, yeah, so it was a mixed bag of reactions that we've kind of gone through from convincing them about like, quitting my job and starting full time and then coming back and you know doing bootstrapping for quite a while and going ahead and building a company from there on. Okay. So, Ravi, how was it during your days? You have been doing this for quite some time. We are talking about some decades earlier on. And how was the scenario there? And what do you think is the support system evolving currently in India? What's yeah. the change? So, you know, I, I did startups because I kind of had an idea that I thought was, uh, you know, a pain point that I could solve, right? And uh, essentially, it was just came instinctively to me. I, I didn't really think much. If I had thought a lot, probably wouldn't have done it. <laughs> Because you know, there's you know, if you think too hard, sometimes you come up with lots of reasons why you shouldn't take the leap, right? And but at the same time, you know, you should think too. So it's a balance, right? You shouldn't just do it just because it's cool. You should do it because you think you can have impact. You think you can, you really have something disruptive or something differentiated. You should talk to people and uh, figure it out. And I did all of that. Okay. So I talked to people like my professors. I talked to my fellow students, like, you know, I asked them to pinch me and tell me if I'm crazy, okay. <laughs> and, you know, things like that. And you try to validate with people around you. And, you know, support systems, I think when you do a startup, you can't really expect any support, per se, okay? It's not a system where you can ask for crutches and walk around. <laughs> you know, you have to just go out there and do it yourself, but you can ask for a lot of guidance. So you can make, basically make sure, you know, you're, you're, you're doing things rationally, you're doing things optimally, you're learning from other people's experiences, right? Those are all valuable things to learn because you haven't done it before necessarily. Mm -hmm. You may as well learn from other people's experiences, right? Mm -hmm. So coming to money, uh, you have been in this business. You started Orangescape way back in 2003. And what was your motivation to start this company? And what was the scenario back then? And how do you see it changing currently? So uh, uh, I was in a company called Selectica earlier. It's a Valley-based company. Actually, we were competitors to Trilogy. <laughs> uh, so Accenture bought our division, uh, part of our division, and uh, we had to move into Accenture. Accenture was a services company, and we were into product development. So we came out and started this company called Orangescape. And Accenture basically bought the product, they didn't buy the people. So Accenture became our first client. Right, so that's how we started the company. So basically, we wanted to uh, drive home the point that we can create innovation in India. So that's why, if you remember, we named it as Orangecape, because orange actually comes from a South Indian word. Uh, it's not actually an English word. So innovation roots are in India. That's why we created this product company. Oh, wow. That's great. That's great. That's inspiring. And my next question would be to Ram. So you have been in the valley for quite some time, and you one fine day, you thought, OK, fine, is enough is enough, and you came back to India. And uh, when you wanted to start your product company, did you think about which market that you want to cater to, and what will be your long-term vision? What kind of uh, analysis did you make before you wanted to start your company? Yeah, when, when, we, when I started thinking about uh, really moving into doing a startup, um, you know, I had lots of industry experience, um, uh, was with Microsoft, got bored with the job, I want to do something really different than what I was doing. I was actually running a BI company, and, and then at that point of time, actually when I started thinking about it, I looked at a lot of options. You know, there were like, um, I mean, uh, I listed out uh, 15 to 16 type of different businesses that we can get into. Um, I looked at people around me who could help me out, guide, uh, and also, uh, you know, give business opportunities for us to uh, to move forward. And that's when I could shortlist a, a particular type of business. You know, what's the market? 
you know, who is around you, you know, can you get some coaching help, uh, mentorship, uh, who can guide you through the system and the process. Uh, do we have any captive customers who can uh, help us out you know, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the start of the, uh, the, the business that we did? Uh, and that's when we decided about uh, you know, what to do and, and, and then we ventured into this business. Um, and that's when mobile thing was actually booming. We started around uh, 2010 when you know, things were just shaping up at that point of time. Okay, cool. So Wamshi, coming to you, you have been around some pretty long time, from 2006. And you got a similar kind of a story. You were in the valley, and you came back, and you got tons of experience working in North America. But you came here, and all of a sudden, you wanted to service the Indian customers. So how different and how challenging was it to work with Indian consumer customers? And what was the kind of expectation? Because typically, what I hear is everything they wanted is free, <laughs> and they want long trial periods, and they want a huge amount of customer base before they even go ahead and pay. And some. Uh, me, me and my partner Shiva started off uh, Apalya, but before to that, you know, as you said, you know, we were in the valley for a long time, and uh, I think we got used to a, a kind of a model mode where you work uh, in a different environment, which is valley environment, which is much more organized, much more professional kind of an environment, uh, from both from a from a you know ecosystem standpoint. But we actually decided to come back and start something on our own. Uh, the first reason was, you know, coming back home, and then uh, the second was to do something uh, which can get you excited and, uh, you know, not really get into a bore, uh, boring desktop job kind of a stuff. I think the initial challenges were to actually identify whether you wanted to do a product or a service, because, you know, uh, the easiest thing was to, you know, decide on going for a service, but actually looking at what, what can make a difference as a product for the Indian consumer. Um, the biggest challenge, like you rightly said, I think uh, acquiring customers in Indian marketplace is very, very tough. Um, so we actually, what we had done is actually, uh, so just to give you a brief, Apalya is a leader in providing mobile video services. So any mobile TV service which you are talking about, whether it's Idea of Mobile TV or Airtel Mobile TV, is completely done by us. So when we actually started up, we actually completely created a new uh, you know, opportunity for ourselves. So it was not like we were chasing an opportunity which is already existing. So we were actually, you know, looking for an opportunity to be created. So we actually went ahead and, uh, you know, pioneered this. We actually found out a USP product when data was non-existent. Mobile was actually much more futuristic at that point of time. It's becoming a reality right now. But, you know, six years has been a long uh, this thing. So. You know, identifying customers, doing prototypes, it took like three years for us to, you know, get to a prototype stage and getting your first customer on board. And like rightly you said, you know, for that kind of stuff, especially when you're in a product mode, you need to be, you know, very cautious about, you know, your spend, the kind of money you're investing when you're bootstrapping, and, you know, how long you can run before you actually can uh, get customer, basically. And uh, once you get a customer, then, you know, you're talking about traction building and all that stuff, which will take much more longer time. Um, so cycles are very long when you're talking about products. Uh, sometimes you can get lucky, but you know it's not always the case. So uh, you, you just need to be patient to be building that product. So what one thing we have observed is it's more of a herd mentality. So it's very tough when to get your first customer, but you know once you get the first customer, you've proven the point. It's much more easier to actually start getting you know additional customers, uh, start building traction and all that stuff. I think you know that's what we have observed. Okay, that's great. So I'll, I'll also come out with a statement which I've often heard uh, out here, especially when it comes to uh, the Indians. It's always been said that Indians are extremely good in solving a problem. Throw any problem, they'll solve a problem, but they are not good at identifying a problem. And that means that they are not good at thinking, problem, thinking about problems in a different way and wearing the thinking cap. So how far is this true, Ravi? <laughs> I think that's a very broad statement, too, too broad a statement, right? I think it's just a question of if you're looking at the ecosystem in India today, maybe, you know, we define problem solving in the context of this discussion as a, as a mature startup ecosystem that has evidence of success, right? We are at an early stage of that ecosystem in some sense, right? There's lots of evidence of very flourishing enterprises here. If you look at the number of companies that are listed on the Bombay Stock Exchange, less than 1% received any VC funding, I'll tell you that, okay? Now, all of them are businesses that Indians went out there, solved a problem, built a product, have even now addressing global markets, right? So in the tech space, 
I think we're in the earliest, uh, or early stages of the life cycle, right? So we, we'll build an ecosystem. You will then have evidence of Facebooks and LinkedIn's and Google's coming from India. Yeah. And then you'll say, Indians solve the problem great, right? I think, you know, it's just a matter of time, okay? okay. Just a matter of time. You know, when I, when, I, when I go to any big tech company in the Valley, you talk to, you walk into the conference room for the meeting, and half the guys there are Desis, right? <laughs> so, and, and they're all the top guys, right? So in the tech area, we dominate in some sense, right? So, so it's, we have the, the seed. We just have to get evidence of you know, the next level, right? I think it's just coming. It's inevitable in my mind. Okay. It's just a matter cool. of time. Yeah. And my next question would be to Ram. When you're talking about a startup, right, and we, you still don't have any kind of a funding in place and everything is self-funded, uh, how do you guys decide, okay, fine, what will be my revenue models? How do I sustain my company for 12 months or 18 months or uh, two years from now? So what's the kind of revenue model that you're looking at sustaining? Is it pure product space or you've got a combination of services and product? And what is the thing that is working for you currently? <clears throat> so, you know, um, some people might disagree with me, but uh, when we started, we wanted to be a product company, a pure product company, uh, primarily to uh, cater to the mobile needs where, uh, you know, you build once and could be used on any platform uh, in the mobile space. Um, as we started uh, doing our business, uh, uh, we started with uh, captive customers and, you know, we, we got, you know, we were lucky uh, to get a customer who was in the vast industry who wanted to adopt our platform. Uh, but then as we were growing in, uh, because of the environment that we are in where, uh, where though we had customers and we were invoicing, we weren't getting uh, money on time, right? You know, uh, sometimes uh, it takes even a year to receive one of the invoices that you've done, you know, probably like 12 months back or, or even more. So in the context, I think the, the best, at that point of time when I was started thinking, you know, we already built the IP in the mobile space, so now how do I leverage it? So that at least I can start, you know, running the show uh, in the office. Um, you know, primarily salaries and everything that you need to be paid. So we started embarking on saying, you know, why not keep the focus on product? At the same time, you know, do business that actually generates revenue. One of the good parts that I've always, always seen is when, when, when you work with overseas customer, you wouldn't get into the issues of, uh, you know, not getting your money paid. So we slowly diverted our business. You know, we, we capped it at 30% to 40% of our headcount that we have to do services, which actually could generate cash for us, which could be in turn invested in product. You know, there is a downside to it because it slows down uh, uh, the focus that you have on product development, and it would take a longer time. But at least uh, it will help us to run the show right now um, in, in making sure that things are getting worked out. But we, we haven't lost our uh, focus in developing the product. We keep innovating every day. Uh, the good thing is we've built a lot of IP in the mobile space, in the VAS space, um, and also creating products, you know, UI and UX. Um, I'm hopeful that with the investments and the relationship that we have and the cash that's getting generated with the 30% of services would be invested in products and really come up with a product that would really okay. get this. Any comments on this, Ravi? Do you <laughs> think is there a perfect model yeah. in which how you want to sustain. Yeah, so we were discussing this earlier. You know, I, I actually kind of, when I, when I meet with startups that say, we're going to keep ourselves alive with services, right? I understand why they're doing it, because they're trying to bootstrap, they're trying to think, but it's very defocusing, right? I, I think, you know, personally. I think you've just got to go whole hog in one or the other. You know, do the best you can on the services side, build an awesome company there if necessary, uh, or kind of go the product route, right? It's very difficult to do both together, uh, oftentimes because there's, you know, when you're servicing a customer on the services side, you learn a lot of things that then if you compromise on the product side, you actually impinge on your IP. You might create uh, IP there that you cannot really, in some sense, exit, yeah. it may not be fundable, may, object, may overlap with what you're doing for your customers because that's your domain knowledge. Yeah. That's one problem and it's defocusing on your teams. How do you take the best people from the services side and put them on product, right? So companies try to do all of that, it's very hard. And I, but I understand why Ram's doing it, because you know, there's not that ecosystem that will fund him easily, maybe take the early risk. And the only way he can bootstrap is generate some revenue, plow that revenue into the other business. 
But my recommendation to him would be actually run two different companies. Keep them separate from each other. Brand them separately, you know? Literally just be the shareholder in both. What I see oftentimes is one office where both are happening together. <laughs> and that's sometimes hard in my mind, okay. you know? Okay, great. Ani, any comments on that? Yeah, I think it's true. One of the reasons why companies Once like... Oh, uh, what, what he's saying is absolutely true. One of the reasons why even big companies like TCS uh, or even Cognizant or any services companies for that matter struggle to create products is they have to compromise, right? So uh, when your best person is put into product and it takes three years to get the ROI out of the product, your easiest option is to pull him immediately and then put him onto a billable project product. which is billable, right? So you can never get the stars in a services company to be working on the product. It's a very different mindset and you have to focus on product. Okay, great. And uh, Mani, again, coming to your product development itself, what are the kind of challenges that you are facing when you are developing a great world-class product uh, from a UI UX standpoint and actual product uh, managers? Do you think there's sufficient amount of talent who understand UI UX in India? Yeah, I think uh, UX is a struggle. Uh, I think uh, India is trying to uh, be a product destination. And uh, uh, you know, one of the major reasons there is a struggle with UI and UX it's not really because we lack in any technical skills or even, for example, a UI development skill. Today, we saw examples of fantastic applications on HTML5. The real problem is uh, we have to focus from a use case standpoint. Uh, we are all uh, technology people, so we see problems from what we have as a technology rather than what problems exist and then approach from a problem standpoint. So if you look at uh, all the big companies created in US, Right? I mean, uh, think about any company, uh, you name it from Facebook to Instagram, all of, the, all of these people are college grads. Why? Because they face this problem themselves as consumers. So the people who are the problem identifiers are the best people to create uh, outstanding product because it fits the need properly. A technology person will see the problem from his eyes. So anything that he sees might be a problem and he will go after it. You look at Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs' success is merely because he can conceptualize the problem and then he, he, he doesn't take away the focus from the problem. He needs a solution that solves the problem, not a technology which can solve the problem. I think that okay. is the bigger That's focus great. that you need to have. That's great. Arpit, you got, what do you, what's your comment uh, on that? So uh, to a large extent, I agree with uh, Mani. Uh, in the sense that a lot of uh, startups that I have also seen uh, in, you know, while interacting with a lot of startups, the problem has been that uh, people commit themselves to a particular solution. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, for example, uh, today uh, at Gharpe, our vision is to you know kind of simplify payments, and what we do within the company is try uh, to commit ourselves to the vision itself rather than the way that we are solving it today. I mean, the method itself might change, but a lot of startups and a lot of uh, bigger companies also, uh, a couple of companies that I've even worked at they've kind of committed themselves to the solution because they've invested you know, about $15 billion or $20 billion into that solution. But that solution is now ad hoc. It no longer works. Uh, so they have to invest another $15, $20 billion to you know, go via another path, which is kind of a little unfeasible for even for a large company. So this is something that as a startup or as a new grown company like us, uh, we can avoid. We can kind of uh, flip between different methods really, really fast. And that's what most startups or most product developers should kind of commit themselves to. Okay, if this doesn't work, I'm going to take another route, as long as I reach the destination. Okay, okay, great. So Mani, my next question would be, how difficult or easy to, is to find guys who are able to wear multiple hats? You know, when you're going in a startup uh, kind of a phenomena, you're a guy, you expect him to do multiple things, not just a pure coder or a UX designer. Right. So if there is a constraint that has come out, when I say you have got only two people that you can choose from, and there's a product manager, there's a software developer, and there's a UX designer. So who are the two people that you will choose? Right. I, I think we talked about this earlier. Mm -hmm. So most people quit companies because their manager is giving them a tough time. Right. So you don't want to hire a manager into a startup again because you know if you give a gun to a developer, he'll first shoot the product manager, unless you are planning. <laughs> you 
are planning to send the entrepreneur to jail, I don't want you to hire a product <laughs> manager. Better select a UI guy, I mean UX guy, and a coder. I think anything else is an overhead for a startup. That's my view. Okay. And Bamshi, um, you were in a stage where it was early on, uh, it was self-funded, and after a couple of years, you went ahead and you got funding and so on and so forth. So at what point in time a uh, startup should think about funding and what are the kind of different avenues that are available for a startup like yours? Uh, so I think, uh, you know, when it comes to raising capital, basically one of the important things is that, you know, especially for a product-based company, you will have, uh, you know, challenges where, you know, you believe in the product, you strongly feel that the market opportunity exists, you're seeing customer traction. So, you know, you will have a longer period when, you know, sometimes, as I said earlier, you can get lucky, but otherwise you'll have to have wait longer before you start generating a lot of cash and you'll be investing more and more into the product. So I think uh, initial traction, if you can build customers and then start generating revenue, we started off, like to give you an example, we bootstrapped with like, uh, you know, close to like uh, $100,000 between me and my uh, partner. And then, you know, we went to uh, raise additional capital and um, when we got our first customer and we wanted to actually service that customer with the product basically, and we needed to do a little bit of scale of the operation and all that stuff, this is when we actually, uh, you know, there's a lot of community out there, you know, of course your friends and family are the first people you will reach out to to raise capital as much as you can, uh, but the second part is there is enough community out there from angels perspective, you know, there's Hyderabad angels, there's Mumbai angels, there's Bangalore angels, so, for a smaller investment of a capital for somewhere between 100,000 to half a million dollars, you can go to these uh, forums and they're very, very, you know, what you call uh, founder interested angels because they don't really try to screw you up with taking up all the equity, putting 100 clauses behind it, which you don't understand at that point of time. Um, so they're very good to work with from an angel community standpoint. We actually raised like half a million dollars with them. Uh, when we got a first customer and we wanted to scale up that level. Um, later part of it, you know, you start adding more customers, you want to start, you know, growing faster and you know that you need to add people, right? So you need to add more people, you need to invest in technology, you need to invest in operations, which means you need more capital and like you rightly said, the payment cycles are going to be a major problem with, you know, getting your cash flow generated and all that stuff. So that is where you'll need additional capital. Um, so you will go and, you know, there's, there's many, you know, typically they look at, you know, there's uh, not a single straight rule, but they're, they're typically you'll hear these terms of Series A funding, Series B funding, Series C funding, D funding, you know, whatnot, right? But each means that, you know, you're actually at a stage where you're trying to grow the company to the next level, which means you're trying to hire the best talent, you're trying to hire, you know, uh, you know the best resources that are out there in the market, and you're trying to prove a lot of points. So we went ahead and, you know, raised our Series A capital of close to $3 million from, you know, like Qualcomm's, you know, all these guys. Um, and uh, you know, that helped us scale to the next level. And we could essentially see that the investments which we are going in was fueling our growth in a much faster scale, basically. Um, then, you know, uh, and you would be surprised that, you know, that within a span of a year and a half, you're already again looking for money, basically, because, you know, you're growing at that scale. And, uh, you know, we went and did our Series B investment of close to seven and a half million dollars again, um, you know, in 2010. And, um, you know, so it's, it's just that, you know, you are looking at growth and you're seeing the opportunity, you know that you can achieve the next big thing and, you know, you, your money is the constraint which is stopping you from achieving the growth. That's when you actually go and look for capital. And the important aspect of raising capital is, once you get into it, you'll start knowing it is that, it is not that when you need it, but when the money is available. Okay. So you just take it, basically. Cool. Well said. Arpit, this question for you. So do you always, you are an early startup, and uh, I've got a perspective from Wamshi where he, he has been there, done it, and he has thought about five years down the line. So as an early startup, do you always think about your survival? You got your initial, I, I presume you got it from your family and friends and so on and so forth. So do you always think about what you'll be doing it five years from now? What's the kind of horizon that an early startup like you keep in mind when you're starting it? Uh, so uh, to kind of rewind back one and a half years, uh, my first business plan and my first B plan pitch was to my dad. Okay, <laughs> he asked me to write down, I, I gave a 20 slide presentation to him because I wanted money. 
Okay, so so that's where the first source of funding comes from. It's uh, I mean always love your dad. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, apart from that, going forward from there uh, for early stage startups, it is almost always about survival. Uh, we are an operations intensive company and uh, to, and today we are at about what 75 80 employees and we grew from 10 employees to 80 employees in one and a half months and for that we needed capital which is why we went out to angel investors and to you know a bunch of relatives and sometime later uh, a vc also came in so uh, you do need that capital to come in if you really really want to grow accelerate that growth path I mean, we could have gone via an organic growth and done the same thing over one and a half, two years, three years or so, but uh, we kind of chose to kind of move faster with some amount of capital coming in. And uh, raising investment, especially for early stage, uh, I mean, at that point of time, we weren't even generating, we were hardly generating any revenue also. So it does turn out to be a little tough. Uh, the first investor told us we were downright bat crazy with this idea. And uh, that's why we started up. Okay, great. So my next question would be more about uh, a very important aspect of a startup, your mentor and a mentee relationship, okay? And every great startup, if you look at the history of great startup, they always have got great mentors. Having said that, I want to know from Ravi, is it a formal relationship that you have as a mentor and does the relationship continue forever, or does it become a part of the company? And if the mentor is really well, very powerful uh, and very senior, do you think the mentee would be able to take decisions on their own? So where do you draw the line, and how important it is to have a mentor in a startup? Yeah, I, listen, mentors are important in startups. They're important if you're doing a job too, okay, by the way. <laughs> you know, it's very important, you know, when I, if, whenever I, I looked at a job, I said, who will I be working for? Who will I be working with? And what will I be working on as the third question, right? Because it's very important. You're gonna learn a lot by watching somebody in action, right? Yeah. And in a startup, you don't have that ecosystem, right? You don't have the ability to rely on other pillars <laughs> in the system. So what do you do? You have to recreate that somehow. You need to recreate the peer structure. You need to re recreate the seniority structure somehow. The experience kind of that you can draw on, right? So you bring mentors in. Now, mentors are a complicated scenario, right? Because you can go to somebody initially when you're starting out, and the kind of advice you need on day one is different than the kind of advice you need when you release a product. It's different when you've got your Series A and your Series B, right? It's very, very different. And so mentors will, you know, you'll graduate through mentors, <laughs> to be very frank. No, the first guy can't help you four years in when you're a mature company, right? So be, be aware of that work out a professional relationship with your mentor, set expectations both ways, and be willing to go out there and try, because you never know who's willing to mentor you. Actually, you'll be surprised. If you can come with a coherent plan, you can show passion, you can show that you are going to actually be very committed to something, a lot of people are willing to help. And it's not necessarily in a monetary equation. Though you may throw that in, right, to keep the mentor tied up, okay? and to make sure that there's something in, there's some skin in the game for them, and there's some way for you to compensate them, right? But that's less, more often than not, that's not the equation that matters. It's actually the fact that they're going to have some impact in getting somebody to the next level, right? So it's, it's important. It's clearly important because it's, it's the way to kind of, not to reinvent the wheel, because you as an entrepreneur, gosh, there are patterns. In computer science, we go, we, we design, we have design patterns, right? Yeah. You wouldn't go there and say, I'm gonna sit down and now invent the algo from scratch, right? You'd go talk to somebody, you'd go research on the web, you'd go look at the books that are out there, you'd go borrow from a library, right? The uh, well-known codified pattern. That's what you're trying to do here through a mentor, is let me not go back, reinvent the wheel, let me go pick out something, let me solve problems faster, get over hurdles faster, right? But listen, mentors won't build your company for you. They won't get you customers. <laughs> they won't do the pitch for you, right? You have to do all of that yourself. They won't do the hiring for you. So don't expect all that, right? Okay. So don't expect some magical thing from a mentor. <laughs> okay. Just okay. because you have So Mani, how did, how did you go ahead selecting or identifying a mentor for your company, and do you have one? Oh, actually, uh, you know, we come from India, and we have right from our uncle to grandfather uh, giving advice, all sort of advice, <laughs> irrespective of whatever. <laughs> 
that is what I'm so in my view a uh, mentor is not somebody who is giving you giving you generic advice uh, but really somebody who can actually give you a connection either in terms of investment connection or either in terms of go to market uh, connection it could be marketing sales whatever it is right uh, that's the kind of mentors i would uh, ideally want to look at and one of the other things that's important is while they might be a pain in the back find potential customers as your mentors because you are looking for problems right you don't want somebody who is patting your back and then saying yeah your technology is good you actually want customer to validate your need as well so have customers as your mentors rather than somebody who is giving you free advice great pankaj what do you think yeah i i tend to i think uh, you know maybe uh, not completely agree with that uh, i mean that's one aspect of it uh, you know building a relationship more with a customer more to you know see acceptance of your product or you know whatever it is uh, but i think the way we understood mentorship was i think uh, more than actually the product is one form of it but actually uh, uh, when you're running as an entity as a company i think there's a lot more mentorship that comes into play which means you know what is the company how it needs to be structured how you actually go out or bring in the right resources that are required for that company uh, you know also talking about you know how do you actually grow the company which means you know saying you know what does investment mean or what does capital raise mean you know how do you take it to the next level i think uh, like you know rightly said every stage has a different mentor basically you know I, and for us you know when when I, i when i look at it i think the biggest part was when we actually raised our angel capital there was a structure which came into place which is you know you have your board members and all that stuff you can find mentors in them they can be of great asset basically because they can help you get customers they have inroads into people but at the same time they can be at a level where they understand that you have no clue of what you know what to expect and they can help you guide through the process and it's very tough to find those people but there are uh, one thing i would like to reiterate is you know it's very tough when you're actually starting up but a guaranteed thing is that there are enough people out there in the ecosystem who are ready to help and we have seen that personally i think uh, from all the ecosystem partners to people there is enough support there who come by and stand by you to help you without expecting a lot okay that's great yeah, Yeah. So I had one thing there, you know, to Mani's point. I actually have a counterpoint to that, okay. which is, you know, we had a bunch of mentors who were helping us, and they were very powerful guys who introduced us to all these POC customers, right? And they were so powerful that when we went to the POC customer, they would immediately start the POC for us and everything. Okay, it was a lot of busy work. These weren't real customers. They weren't representative of the real market, right? they became our pocs because why because we had a powerful connection into them they immediately wanted to do a favor to the mentor and they gave us access and we were spending a lot of time we weren't learning about the real customer these guys even if they were to issue a po a po to us it wasn't real revenue in the sense that it was not replicable right yeah. it was not scalable yeah. we weren't learning enough and when we backed off those and actually got went out and fought for real customers we were much better off So you know, there's a. I, I think you know you got to be very cautious when you know mentor actually helps you get a customer, mm -hmm. because oftentimes, especially they're very uh, senior in the industry, you'll get somebody and then you'll waste a lot of resources. You know, so startups be very aware, right? Be aware of that. I, I'm sure money's had a different experience. It's different for different folks. I just lay that out as a as a caution, right? Yeah. Uh, when yeah. you're dealing with mentors. Yeah. Cool. So are there one do's and don'ts? Because when I asked them in morning during my keynote, how many of you want to start their own product companies? Almost 90% of them raised their hands. So uh, is there a piece of advice that you want to give to each of the uh, uh, people in the audience today? We'll start with Arpit. Uh, if you are doing a product development company, it's going to take a while. It's going to take a long time. So I mean, and. it's going to take at least about 3 years or 4 years before you have a mature product <coughs> excuse me uh, that you can market out and that you can you know call yourself you know attach your name to it and say you know what that's mine and i'm proud of it because up to that point of time you're always going to you know say yeah yeah that's mine but yeah, it's under work it's under work so it's going to take quite a while and uh, that's why the journey on a product development cycle is much longer but the returns on top of that are we we more than what you would get out of doing a pure services based uh, company or a team 
Ravi? Yeah, so I'd say, you know, there's never been a better time to start a product company than now, okay? You know, when I did my first product company almost 20 whatever plus years ago, I coded in Microsoft C++, right, in C. And there was hardly an IDE that you could call an IDE, right? There were command line tools. I used to buy libraries from, you know, unknown developers to maybe improve my productivity. Today you have platforms, the Google platform, the Apple platform, the Facebook platform, right, that you can just build on. You have tremendous tools. Look at the HTML demos we just saw. I mean, that stuff was unbelievable, you know, even five years ago, right? I mean, those, those APIs are just available. You have the ability to reach customers throughout the world. From a small little second tier city in India, you can reach the whole world and sell to them. You can monetize your product, right? You can be discovered if you're awesome. There's review systems that will bubble you up to the top. I mean, it's, the world is as flat as it's ever going to get for a product startup, right? And you just gotta go there and really execute to a world-class standard, right? So I would be very excited if I were, you know, uh, in, in the shoes of some people who are now starting up, right? It's a very exciting time to start a product startup, and I would just be very encouraging. I just say make sure you've got, because there's so much stuff out there, you can't just be another also rant, right? You can't just be, I'm a refinement of this idea. <laughs> you really need to make sure you, you're delivering value, right? In a, in, a, in a superior way. That's the key thing, I think, you know? Cool. Uh, I would give, leave. Great, thanks. Money. So, uh, three points, actually. Uh, the first point is, uh, believe in journey is the reward. I mean, you can't go after success all the time. Uh, you have to feel whatever you are doing is very good. You should be passionate about it. If you are passionate about it, then your journey will be great. It doesn't matter what your end result is. That's number one. Number two, keep your liabilities low if you are starting a company. If you have an EMI at 40,000 rupees plus a car EMI at 20,000 rupees, if you have 60,000 rupees to pay monthly if you have bought a house and a car, it's hard for you mentally to take away that and lose a job and start another company. So keep your liabilities low. Number three, don't worry about failure. You might fail in a startup, but remember, when you're running a regular job, you're running a rat race. You might fail, but you would have succeeded in raising your level playing field to something else, right? Because the experience is all it matters. You could be a CEO or a CTO or you know, a, a product strategist in another company at the age of 25 or 26 if you have started the company. So remember this three. Cool. Yeah, Ram. Um, so I think from my experience, first uh, is you need to get ready. Um, you really want to do development or product development, you have to get ready for it. You know, think through. Um, you know, um, when I uh, started, uh, I wanted to be a core product development because that's where I come from. But things don't shape up as you expect. Um, so you have to be ready for, you know, um, how the, I mean, how it flows. So you don't expect that. You know, you got to think about it long term. Like, like you know, how you guys were saying. Sometimes I regret why you know I've started services. Why not focus on product? And you always are in the dilemma of saying, okay, what what is that you need to do, right? You know, whether it's the team you have hired needs to be paid first versus the vision that you have that you wanted to go forward. And it's it's very difficult. And you know, you go through that pain every day. You know, I think end of the day, you have to make sure you make the right decision, whatever it is, right? In my case, you know, I sometimes feel I made the right decision because I'm able to pay salaries every month. But sometimes, you know, coming from a, a much better background, being a, at a very senior level in Microsoft, coming and not seeing the vision uh, being achieved, you know, dissatisfies me as saying the purpose of me leaving the company has not been accomplished. So it's difficult, uh, so prepare for it, you know, stick to the um, journey that you won't have cut out and just stick to it and, and you know, don't change unless it's really needed is what my advice to, to the people. Cool. Amshik. Yeah, I just feel that, you know, uh, we started this company like when I was 35. I only regret is that, you know, I should have started this right out of the college. You know, I keep thinking that you know, I should have done this again and again, you know. The only reason being is that, you know, I think there's a lot of learning, lot of failures, right? But the success will come to you in a way which you will not even imagine, basically. 
So, you know, the more failures, the more learnings, the more success basically. Uh, it's challenging, but if you start after college, I think that's the best time to start, you know. And uh, not worrying about, uh, you know, what your social family pressures are. Uh, not getting married is the best thing to start a company. <laughs> um, because he was talking about liabilities, you know, this, the liabilities is not just the car and all that, but also the family, right? So just take care of them, do as many experiments as you can before you get um, kicked on the right route. And sometimes you might be get uh, lucky and become, make a lot of money before even you get married, so, you know. Wow. Yeah. Uh -huh. point. I, I completely agree with Vamshi. You know, when I quit Microsoft, I thought, you know, I'm a guy who can, you know, really lie low and make things happen. And, uh, you know, being very people-oriented and stuff for like that, and I could go to any extent. Once I started the company, I realized the low uh, that you have to go in terms of everything, you know, your personal life, uh, professional life, it's unimaginable. You, every day you think you've gone low, but there's still so much you still need to go down to really stand up. Uh, because, um, you know, it's, it's just unimaginable. Even today, every day I feel a block, a roadblock, or something that comes in, you have to just be ready for facing it. Um, and there is no day uh, when you've come into an entrepreneur uh, thing that you think that you would not have a block, or a roadblock, or you have to step down it could be your ego, it could be your um, you know, finances, your lifestyle, everything. Something has to be compromised on every day, which will take you there. But that, once you withstand that, I think you would see success. And that's, that's how I look at it. And be prepared, for, be prepared for it. Great. Great piece of advice. So if I want to summarize this, now we come to the end of a panel discussion. Uh, there is a lot of sacrifice which is uh, necessary. But at the end of the day, as Vamshi clearly pointed out, when you are, when you get rewarded, you will get a little Okay? So with that note, we come to the end of panel discussion. Great round of applause. Let's have a big round of applause to the panel members. We open it for Q&A for next 20 minutes. We have kept more time for Q&A this time because there were a lot of people. So if you want to ask any questions to any of the panel members, please, Go to their respective mics and please ask them questions. It's open. Uh, hello, my question is, uh, often for a startup, there is a fear of losing his idea to the big players. So uh, how should one deal with it? Should he still continue going pitching to others or should he get a patent done or at what level should he go for a patent how does it work when especially for a startup he has a idea which is very precious to him yeah so I, I can take that i mean listen I, I i've never been of the theory that you know the idea will get stolen so easily okay i mean there are i'm sure at google there are thousands of ideas on your walls okay and probably in fact you'll have you'll have more narrowly focused some of your ideas too more recently i mean you you know big companies just can't act that fast I mean, and, and they're not interested in, you know. <laughs> That's why you're all here. <laughs> and, and, and honestly, they would rather maybe put some money into you, fund you, and then buy you later, than, than squeeze you out of your idea, right? I mean, the idea has to be implemented, okay? Somebody has to passionately own that idea, champion it, build it, build a team around it. You know, Google, for instance, swallows more startups because there's talent there and an idea and, and a team and, and, you know, some passion, right? Uh, more often than not. So, you know, I, I've never, you know, you, you should be actually more scared of your friends stealing your idea from you <laughs> than, than, than the big companies, honestly, you know? Uh, because you, they're more likely to start another two-bit startup company, right? And go try to do the same thing and confuse everybody. And so, you know, that, that would be more likely than, than a big company, honestly. Yeah, and just to add, um, I mean, this question keeps coming when we do product brainstorming in, my, in our company and when we keep on saying, my team says, okay, we should keep it safe, you know, hide it. You know, my advice is, you know, when you have an idea, run with it faster so that nobody can catch up. So implement it, you know, look at it, explore it, expose it, and then go forward and just run faster than anyone so that people will never catch up. And it takes time for them. It, you know, the amount of effort you put in to realize them, it will, they're at least three to six months behind where you are. So you always have the market, just 
just exercise your idea and, and implement it. Cool. Any, any more questions? Please, we've got experts out here. Please take the opportunity to ask relevant questions. Maybe just adding on to that, I think, Arpit, uh, when he said, like, we had 10 people and when we moved 18, one and a half month, maybe that could be one of the things, like, somebody else might choose his uh, idea. But, yeah, my question is, uh, you, you all are, like, product-based entrepreneurs. Is there something that services-based entrepreneurs should be doing something different? And why is that you are having hiring people to do your work? You have an idea, give it outsource to the services guy, get the idea ready and sell it. Is that something, or maybe they might not be as passionate as you guys think? Yes, no, product, uh, sorry. Sorry. product is all about passion, right? Why do you build products? Because you are passionate about it. You think you can outsource an idea to somebody else and that guy will be passionate enough to do your product? I think the great products are created, like Instagram, which was sold by, by a billion dollar was created by 11 people, right? You think you can outsource that to somebody else? I don't think that's possible. Just to add on to what uh, Mani just said, uh, uh, just to add yeah, on ahead. to what Mani just said, is uh, even though you may not outsource the core of what you're doing, uh, but all the privileges or the trivialities associated with the core, uh, what we've seen is, or I've seen is, it's much better to outsource it out. Keep the core, uh, keep the core experience yours, but all the trivialities, maybe, you know, some web portal or so, some forum or some et cetera, et cetera, just outsource it out because it's not worth the effort. Outsourcing happens when you are commoditizing a service. So when you have learned the problems, even in forums, you want to be the first person to understand it. Once you know the nuances, to commoditize and to scale, you can outsource it. But outsourcing the skill set because you don't have, in my view, is not a good idea. You have to know what, what, what problem you are solving. Um, you had a view on this, Ram? I mean, I think the question was more about, uh, I mean, if you if wanted you got to a service product idea, why did you outsource it and we'll develop it for you? No, I think one of the challenge with services industry is like one of the point that, I mean, I always elude is, uh, you know, someone defines a problem and uh, services guys execute it. But the difference when you have your own team versus a services team, you know, Predominantly services, you know, I've seen a lot of companies where you get a scope of work and you execute to it. But in terms of product, it's an evolution that you do. So you want everyone who's developing the product needs to contribute to the product. So that's where having a core internal team or, you know, even if the services uh, company, or I, I use the word consulting, right, who actually takes a problem and try to solve it, if they can partner with you, um, you know, you, you can always outsource it. But, but the challenge is, you know, they don't show as much as interest that, you know, your core team with similar IP, and if they can leverage that IP faster to deliver to go to market, you should leverage them too, always. If the product has some nuances that you know for sure that this company has a niche in it, go for it and get it developed and get your contracts in place so that, you know, they don't really get it. So I'll add one instance where a startup would do well to outsource. Let's say you've just raised a round of funding. Your investors are watching. The mark, you have already launched your product, and you're, you're going to take a very deliberate strategy to hire very good talent. That is hard to do fast, okay, without diluting the culture, without diluting the talent pool. You know, you may not be able to hire fast enough, but you have cash in the bank, and your investors are watching, the market is watching, the competitors are catching up, right? At that point, you're probably best off injecting more capabilities, right, on the team, rather than going slow and waiting till you can build it in-house. So, you know, as the owner of the product, you want the product to hit market with the right set of features, and you might want to spend a lot more to bring talent in, right? That's the one place where I'd spend more. Oftentimes, I've seen startups take funding, go slow, try to build it all in-house, and then they flame out, <laughs> and then nobody wants to do the next round with them because they haven't shown the traction. There's this big P word, right, traction. Yeah, yeah. How will you show traction? You've got to keep your eye on that ball, right? of getting that curve going, <laughs> that hockey stick curve, cool, you yeah. know? Yeah, basically, uh, everyone has an idea, right? But uh, w w when we go into the market, uh, we have faced a lot of management issues, such as uh, do market analysis, uh, many things such as, uh, su many such things. How, to, how did you face those problems when you entered the market? So, don't listen to them. <laughs> See, basically, there are two kinds of markets, right? Consumer products and enterprise markets. Consumer products originate because you, you understand the problem yourself. You face that problem yourself. Enterprise problems are all about understanding another person's 
problem, right? So you are trying to uh, stand in other person's shoes and then you are trying to solve that problem. So if you are looking at a consumer problem, if you think that problem is something that is genuine, you are facing, go for it. Don't listen to anybody. You will find others. You might be crazy enough to be called Twitter because it's very similar to SMS, but you will hit the market with the big bang. If you are a consumer product, then you have to do a lot of market analysis because you are making an assumption on behalf of a customer, therefore do a lot of market analysis. That's my view. But if you need funding from a company, we need to show uh, the entire business model, right? Uh, I mean, th these are all uh, buzzwords, right? Nobody gives you uh, funding for uh, market research. People fund for yeah. traction. traction. So get traction. How do you get traction? <laughs> you actually get customers. The only way to do it is getting the proper need and going to market. Yeah, and it's really cheap nowadays to do some market research, okay? Mm -hmm. You can put together two HTML pages that have two different product sets, right? Put Google AdWords out there. See how many people hit it. How many people want a white paper from you, you know? If you can't write a white paper about your own product, what you're proposing, and, and be able to give that away free, then you're, you're not ready for funding yet, right? So all you need to do is you can reach people very easily now, give them two A, B offers, see what products they want, run a survey, go to forums. You know, there's a lot of ways of doing research that's actually very valuable. You just can't hire a firm to do that. You have to do it as the owner of that product, right? Nobody else can do that for you in the, in the initial stage. I'm sure that you guys are experts. So but before going, asking my question, I just want to share something with my friends. All, all those who are talking about ideas, I just want to tell you, surprise, guys, your idea is not unique. I mean, there are billions of people out here, and uh, I'm very sure Facebook was not Mark Zuckerberg's idea. It's how well you execute it, and that will going to make a difference. Right. So, so my question is, uh, how do you go about finding the initial set of team, initial set of co-founders that are really passionate and really, uh, you know, uh, you know, which are guys are really crazy and just like you who can make <laughs> things going. It's just not about the idea which you have, it's just about the people and the team which you go with this, uh, as a start, yeah. Basically call each one of us crazy, right? <laughs> Did you mention that? <laughs> the best way is steal from your earlier company, <laughs> right? So when we started uh, Orangecape, uh, we came out with a team, right? So all uh, my manager, myself, my entire team came out and started the company. So, still from your earlier company. I disagree with him. You know, I, I hate to do that. I, <laughs> um, I think, uh, you know, in the journey you would make, you would believe in people who, um, who are always around you, who know is capable. You know, sometimes you might not uh, find people who, who know, has knowledge in it but you know that they're capable enough to research and get things done for you, right? So there's always people, you know, explore in interest and, you know, pursue and, and uh, you, know, uh, you know, provoke. Sometimes they don't want, I mean, they, you, you always see people who are dull, you know, who don't want to do things. You need to sometimes, you know, poke them, you know, and say, hey, you know, why not? Well, how will it help? I mean, you know, so it, you will always find it. You just need to have, you know, get onto the journey when you need it you will find it. That's what I believe strongly in. I mean, you don't have to coach people, but you will always find it. You just have to keep an eye who is around you and, uh, and who is capable enough so that you can get them on board. So I have been you know, uh, taught this from many people that if you're starting up, go with a person who is more experienced with you. But I feel if, if someone is more experienced, he might be you know, suppressing me with his ideas and talking about that this is good and this is how you should go about. How do you... you know? Uh, yeah. So, you know, don't, don't just go for your friends, right? Because you've you got to be able to convince somebody who's as smart, if not smarter than you, that your idea is viable, right? So, and somebody who's an expert in that area, you know? So sometimes go, LinkedIn's there, whatever, you know, you can find people really easily. Go pitch the idea to them, right? Try, you know, you need to recruit world-class teams to be able to compete nowadays. You just can't, you know, your, your three friends may not be the best expertise for that specific idea. Now, I'm not saying don't recruit your friends, they're great, but they need not necessarily be founder number one, two, three, four, right? <laughs> There's lots of other talent that you can bring to bear, you know? Right. You're able to reach people and, and see what they've done uh, so easily nowadays, you know? And reach out to them. Yeah, I think look for people who are diverse than you. And, you know, it's okay to find people who are smarter, but make sure they're diverse. You know, don't get the same type of skill set because it doesn't really add value. Right. Thank you. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, my question is uh, something which I got it from you guys because uh, what we face was uh, 
actually the answer given by you guys like uh, uh, we develop pro uh, products for the other clients and we don't usually get the payments waiting since one year so actually we are planning to get ahead with some products uh, for our own company so what do you suggest us like uh, to uh, drag in our top players uh, who might pay, uh, pay around 30k or shall I go with the uh, uh, inexperienced guys, the freshers, uh, whom, I uh, whom I pay uh, much less to say 10K or somewhere. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm not I didn't get the question yeah, completely. Yeah. I, but think you I, got, I got his, <laughs> I mean, I think the question is, with the uncertainty you have, do you invest in people who you have to pay more um, versus get uh, people from the college uh, and pay less yeah. and then get your product done, right? That's what your yeah. question is. It's, it's where it's, it's a compromise. It's, yeah. it's, uh, it's a compromise. You know, what I did, you know, we've invested, you know, even now, 60% uh, of our team are actually grown in-house. We've got them out of the college and really built them. But then after two and a half years, we have almost 50%, I mean, almost 50, or probably around 80 people, 80% 80 of the people who we hired from college still take, stick to us because they understand us. So there's pros and cons to each of them, but it slows down your vision yes. that you have. Um, you know, I, I've been happy so far with, with the investment we did, because and in the industry that we are in, we didn't find people who are um, lateral hires where people had four years experience in iOS development or even Android development. So for us, it worked out. But then, you know, my recommendation, like my mentor said, that we need to hire people who can accelerate when you have opportunities around. Like yes, but, but the mentality is somewhat, somewhat different. They don't work for the complete eight hours. In the eight hours, they work only for two or three hours. And the remaining time they spend around roaming here and there. So Then you don't hire them. <laughs> yeah, that's what. Like, you know, we don't find, uh, don't find <laughs> people uh, like that. Because we'll, 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 take it, we'll definitely take it offline. We'll sure, have sure. money you. to be answering that only for you. Money will give you <laughs> HR counseling. <laughs> Money, the HR counselor. <laughs> okay, my name is William. First of all, thanks for taking this this panel to the to the startup and entrepreneurial topic because I think having this frame of Google actually talking about this instead of you know all the products and, and that is actually a great opportunity for all of us. Thank you. Uh, one thing I wanted I wanted to share with you is that actually I I came I, I came nine months ago to start uh, as entrepreneur. I quit my job. I I've gone through that period, as you say, that you have to release some part of your lifestyle and eat rice for a month or <laughs> things like that. But, and, and one experience I had is uh, now that we are talking about team members and, and, and bringing your team and building your, your company from the beginning, is that I had to choose, as he said, you know, from, from freshers or people more experienced, and I actually chose to go for the experienced people and, and I had the chance, you know, I had all this to share this passion with the people and got really good profiles. Now the thing is, uh, it's being now so difficult to actually uh, move on on the product development and these kind of things. So what would be your advice in that sense, right? And the second thing is that uh, if there's in, in this, uh, as, as you say, take every, every opportunity that you have to invite someone and, and to do networking. I'm taking my opportunity in this, in this micro to invite everyone that has actually decided to, to start a company and to, to leave his job behind a, a great vision to meet me anytime uh, outside. <laughs> so I, I don't know what your, advice, advice. <laughs> uh, what your advice in, in that sense, uh, you know, now that you have people compromising the product, really capable but not actually putting a hundred percent or moving as fast as you would need to to hit the market. Uh, okay, I, I gave my answer. People are not happy with it. You know your colleagues earlier, right? So you know you, they are proven. If they are good, you can take it in. But you know people are raising ethical yeah. issues, so I'm going to be different. I think uh, one thing I've realized uh, in the last two and a half years with the journey that I made, uh, you know, I came from a place where uh, where I used to hire the top talent, right? You know get the cream of everywhere, right? Even you go to colleges. But things are different. When you, when you have a startup, when you have a pressure on cost, things are different. Mm -hmm. I, what I have always seen uh, when, uh, when you have slow, slow down, 
and I think you need to do that extra bit of work to make them excited about what you're trying to do, and what type of product you're trying to build, and how will it benefit them in the long run, and, and show some, some, give some type of uh, incentive or something of that sort which actually will motivate them and the cause why you have to get these things done. There could be reasons like if you don't deliver this product by next six months, you know, we would even be behind the market and doesn't make sense, our vision wouldn't really realize. So you'll have to have some type of, uh, you know, uh, spend time with them really to uh, help them understand, you know, you have to get them on board. There's nothing else you can do and it will always flow down. So figure out ways that you can get them on board. Uh, okay, so we've got time for the last two questions. We are really running out of time. Thank you very much for this forum, and I, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, I don't know where you guys are because we can't Google search you, but thanks for inviting us and to meet this panel. My question is, it's been two years, and I'm still planning to start up. But I don't know, where, how will you help a person to you know, stop too much of thinking and start doing? At what, what should be the first step if there is a startup to be done? Oh. That's my question. And you know, I left so many jobs, I mean, not so many, one job already, but you know, I did not find a kick startup. You know, people say investment. Investment, I can find investment, that's not a big deal. But the thing is, I even, maybe I even have an idea. I don't know, but idea evolve. It doesn't just come up. I, even I don't know my idea will evolve or not. But the thing is, I want to stick up to that idea. But what should be the first step for a person to start up? What should he do to get into the market and you know, explore? Whether I fail, I don't, I don't care. But what I want to know is how things will evolve and I could learn out of it. What should be my first step? I think with, I'll, your I'll job, I mean, first with your job, sit at home. Uh, within a month, you're going to get dead bored with Facebook. Okay. It's been a year. I'm, I, I, I'm bored with Facebook. But you know, every time I keep thinking of idea, but I don't know. When I speak to people technically, they say uh, your idea is very small to think crazily. I say I'm crazy. Don't bother about that. I leave that person. I go to someone else. So what should be? It should be the feasibility report or something that you expect a person to come up with, oh. or the ex. You know, we can't expect what's gonna be tomorrow with my idea. So how to start up? So I tell you, there are C's in startups, right? You gotta get co-founders. You gotta get cash. You gotta get customers. Okay. You gotta get coaching. Okay. You've got to get all of that together, and you just got to do it. And you know, you got to do all of those concurrently. So there's not, you can't do sequentially. You can't think, I'm going to figure out who the customer is, and I'm going to build the product first, then figure out the customer, and then I'm going to get capital, and then I'm going to hire co-founders and colleagues. No, you got to do all the C's together. That's what a startup is. That's why they say wearing many hats, right? It's, it, it, that, that, that's, those are the successful entrepreneurs who are able to do all that together, right? 99% of startups fail. I'm sorry to tell the room, right? I mean, even 99% don't even get funded, first and foremost. Those that get funded, 99% of them fail, okay? So, you know, there's a high mortality rate. But that doesn't stop anybody from trying because there's a lot of opportunity, right? And there's very low, real, real risk is very low. On, the, on, 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 you know, because it's just human capital. So yeah. I should find... The day, you, the, day you, they, the day you fail, you just go apply for a job and you're back in business. Yeah. So I must find out four C's yeah. that you, that you yeah. mentioned. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. First step is to get that four C's. I, I think, yeah. think, think through all of those and have confidence, right? Okay. They are last so, C's. So <laughs> one last question. Sorry, we're running out of time. That's thank for you, the lady. Thank you very much. That's for the lady, and we are winding up. So we can take all of the questions later on. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity first. And my question is, if you have two years of time and 10 lakhs of money, uh, would you invest it for MBA or uh, startup? Like, uh, even after MBA, yeah. wait, wait, wait. I have a point to make over here. Like, uh, even after MBA, I just want to start up. Well, uh, I can start up with a nil balance of, uh, after doing my MBA, or uh, I can uh, do, I mean, start up directly with that. that uh, I think there will be a unanimous decision that you should go with a startup. Never start invest up. in an MBA. <laughs> yeah. okay. So it doesn't matter idea. whether you do an MBA or you don't do. When you do a startup, you have to go through the pain that you need yeah. to go through. Okay. Right? So, <laughs> uh, so the MBA doesn't solve all the problems. Uh, but I think, uh, yeah, there's, yeah, that's what I Lastly, would want. Lastly, what's the entrepreneur's, uh, I mean, uh, success definition? Like, what, how do you define success as? Journey. Journey is survival. Different people define it differently, yeah. right? Some people, yeah. actually, you know, many people get mistaken. They think just getting funded is success. And that's wrong. That's just the start of the journey. 
In fact, that's first base, right? Is to get funded. And most entrepreneurs get exhausted just getting to that point. In fact, the, the best entrepreneurs get that almost automatically. If you know Larry Page and Sergey Brin want to get funding, do you think they'll have any problem getting funding? They don't even have to put their own money, right? Yeah. So the funding wouldn't be a problem for them. Now they have to go pick the next idea that might be the next Google, right? That would be hard for them, even them, right? To get the, an idea that big and execute it and build a team and all of that, right? So that's, you know, there's a lot more to, the first step is funding, that's hard enough. The next step is get customers and then get them to pay you, then get, scale that up and then exit, right? And there are only two parts of exit, right? It's IPO or get bought by somebody. <laughs> and those, you, both of those are hard, okay, I'll tell you. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. One more. Yeah, this for you, Vamshi. Hey, thanks, man. Thank you. Thank you. The claps, please. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Ravi. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, sorry. <laughs>